Thank you for joining Farm Credit East on today's webinar, The Mixed Markets of the Northeast Forest Products Industry. Uh, our co-sponsoring organizations include the Connecticut Professional Timber Producers Association, the New Hampshire Timberland Owners Association, the Massachusetts Forest Alliance, and the Empire State Forest Products Association. Our presenter today will be Eric Kingsley. Eric Kingsley has been with Innovative Natural Resource Solutions for a number of years. He has worked with dozens of parties on the development of new forest industries and often works to deploy or create unique financial tools to support the industry. He has a number of professional, a number of years of professional experience consulting, leading, and doing research for forest industry organizations, uh, renewable energy products, is an expert in the economics of natural resource-based industries. Um, I'd like to just present a brief disclaimer here that the information presented, while, while we believe to be accurate as of today and is um, presented in good faith, is not intended to be investment tax or legal advice. With that, I will turn it over to Eric and let him begin his presentation. I'm hoping you now see my screen. Yes. Eric Kingsley with Innovative Natural Resource Solutions. Uh, I'm a partner in, a, in the firm. And as Chris mentioned, I work with forest industries uh, in renewable energy projects. Have done that all over North America. I'm based in Portland, Maine, and the bulk of my practice is here in the Northeast. So really appreciate the opportunity to share what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, and what uh, some forest markets might look like going forward. Really quickly, I'm going to be talking about three big product categories. Um, these aren't all the product categories, and we'll touch on some of the, the outliers. But really, when we talk about wood harvested in this region, we're talking about biomass, pulp wood, and saw logs. And while the mix can vary within the region, so sort of what state or what part of a state you're in, the fact remains that each of these in the region writ large is, uh, is an important market. Probably regionally, we're somewhere uh, around a third, a third, a third in terms of volume harvested. However, I always like to remind people that it's, uh, while well, the low-grade market's critical, and that's both pulp wood and, and biomass, it's the saw logs that drive landowner returns and uh, need to keep that in mind as, as we think about these markets. Uh, with that, I'm just going to cover market by market, and we're going to start with uh, with saw logs. This uh, quickly, just a picture of uh, Pleasant River lumber full of saw logs last year. Uh, from what I understand, they're full again, and they're not alone. We talk about saw logs, probably the single great, the single greatest indicator of market health, and this is obviously true for spruce fir structural lumber, but true for all uh, all lumber products. Housing starts is our greatest indicator on how things are going. Uh, this looks at housing starts over the last 30 years. See a nice ramp up. You see the housing led recession, which actually started long before uh, long before the official recession began. And then a nice and what was being viewed as a sustainable ramp up. We we're probably never going to get to the 2005 levels. We were on a nice steady ramp up. Uh, this is just the last five years, and you'll see uh, while we had a nice spike in housing starts nationally, that was met with a rather dramatic and fast collapse as soon as the uh, COVID-19 pandemic hit. And we're going to see that that COVID-19, its short-term and long-term effects on the economy, really sort of ripple through all the sectors. Um, that said, while we've certainly had some, uh, some drop, lumber prices have sort of held. And the reason for that is uh, fairly simple. Um, that is a number of mills, particularly mills in the Southeast and Pacific Northwest, as well as some in Canada, 
elected to take some downtime. And by taking supply off the market, uh, by, you know, by, by managing the supply side uh, to, to coincide with a decrease in demand, prices were generally able to hold. So when we look over the past few months, what have we seen? We've seen that uh, the forest products industry is deemed an essential industry in almost every state. There were certainly some hiccups in this region or proximate to this region, but eventually the forest products industry was really found to be essential. Uh, that said, uh, not everywhere saw economic activity at the levels we, we've previously seen. As I mentioned, housing starts are down. Um, home sales have slowed nationally, uh, but they're certainly still happening and they are happening more in rural or semi-rural suburban areas than they are in cities. And this is, that's really a, a change that, that uh, from what we've seen the last decade. What is way up very, very strong is home modeling and home repair. So what that means is that if you stick people home for two months, they eventually get to the projects they've been putting off for years. Um, so with that, we're seeing record demand from home uh, home centers, the Home Depots, the Lowe's, uh, the more localized lumber yards. Not huge quantities on an individual sale basis. A lot of this is being put in a pickup truck or on top of a station wagon, but or I guess it's an SUV at this point, but at this point, um, a lot of little sales are certainly adding up. As I mentioned, some mills primarily in, in other parts of North America have been taking some downtime. Um, most mills I've spoken to, and of course, for everything I say, we can probably find an exception, but most folks have been operating pretty normally what they would be this time of year. Um, but uh, what concerns me is that through by operating uh, as they would normally this time of year, um, as well as having large inventories uh, in mud, for mud season, I'm hearing that folks have record inventory of both logs and of sawn lumber. What that means is we're probably going to see um, uh, some slowing in timber markets as as the economy begins to bounce back, just because there's so much pent up uh, inventory, both unprocessed and processed. We're also seeing uh, throughout the region, many towns haven't been approving building permits. Um, obviously, if you don't approve a building permit or you don't approve the next steps in, in building, uh, the houses, house construction doesn't start. Uh, lumber isn't sold, panels aren't sold. It's beginning to be taken care of, but certainly a, a backup problem. Um, we're hearing from hardwood mills with export, export markets that they've done okay. And um, as their customers in Asia have returned, they're now sending product there. There are some long-term concerns I'll touch on in a second, but they're certainly, um, they're finding those markets seen some uh, general price softening. It's hard to, to sort of sort out what's related to uh, pandemic and what's just what happens in spring every year. Um, all that said, we're gonna know a lot more by end of summer, both about the general economy and solid wood products. Looking at some species groups, some uh, quick observations uh, on the hardwood, the the past year so i think it was uh february or perhaps early march when this ended but really the past year has seen a hardwood as a victim of our country's trade war or or trade skirmish with china um, there were tariffs on on a number of products those came off just in time for uh for the pandemic both uh, obviously customers in asia as well as as here we are hearing uh, what that means is a lot of hardwood mills may not be in a great position to weather um, weather ex extended market challenges. They've just been battered for a year. Um, so that, that's obviously a concern going forward. 
we are hearing on for low grade logs, particularly for mats, some very, very strong demand. So for construction mats, um, as uh, those projects, uh, as utility and, and other large projects continue in the region, we'd expect that to continue to be strong. On white pine, seems to be very specific as to where you're, you're selling your, uh, your boards, but anyone that's selling to the big box home centers or even through local home centers, is really reporting strong demand. It's not the same as strong pricing, but certainly strong demand. Um, on the spruce fir, the structural lumber side, um, mills are moving wood. As I mentioned, that's helped by some of their competitors around the nation and, and Canada taking some downtime, taking, uh, taking supply off the market. Um, and housing starts are pretty clearly a cloud on the horizon. Um, Across all inventory, all species, we're he I'm hearing about high inventory, um, challenging pricing, and some big questions about future market demand. And while all that is sort of normal and cyclical, the thing that keeps me up at night, particularly for softwood sawmills, is what they're going to do with their residue. Obviously, anyone that purchases a log, a cylinder, and sells a rectangle, a board, something has to happen between those, those two activities. And, uh, and everything that's not in that rectangle needs a market. Um, these markets can be extremely localized. So there are some places where this is a big problem, some places where it's probably not. Um, uh, the restart, and what looks like uh, sort of successful operations of the new uh, softwood market at the Old Town Mill in Old Town, Maine, is uh, certainly some welcome news. Uh, unfortunately, that is offset by loss of a very important white pine market when the mill in Anderskog in Maine, the Pixel Mill in, in Jay, Maine, uh, had a catastrophic explosion, which has idled the pulp mill, certainly for a year to years. And there's obviously a potential that, that that'll last forever. And then we'll talk in a few minutes, but uh, uh, biomass markets are shrinking. So previously, when we thought about what to do with mill residues, there's this thought, well, okay, it's not as much money, it's not as high as high a use, but you could always burn it. Uh, that's becoming challenging in some areas. Bright spot on the horizon is uh, some cross is cross laminated timber. Uh, this is a, a market with enormous potential in the Northeast, enormous unrealized potential. Uh, these are very large panels that can be used structurally. If, Basically, they go up, you know, our, uh, builders hate when I say this because it's apparently a lot more complicated, but I like to think they go up like Legos and get snapped together and uh, boom, you've got a building. Um, there's, uh, this region has the resource and the market and a couple announced projects. It is important to note that announced projects don't use a whole lot of actual wood. So at this point, no one's broken ground on cross laminated timber manufacturing in this region. When that occurs, and I'm, I'm confident that will occur, uh, the first plant will almost certainly use spruce fir lumber. Um, that said, long-term, this could well be a market for hemlock, certainly a market, uh, a needed market for hemlock. Some research out of the University of Massachusetts Amherst shows that hemlock and white pine uh, can probably be used, uh, used for these applications. That said, uh, white pine's more expensive and not quite as good as spruce fir, so it's hard to see, uh, hard to see that getting used extensively. Uh, not quite as good on a structural basis. Uh, biomass. Uh, biomass. For, for years has been challenged by relatively low uh, wholesale electricity prices. Uh, those problems have really been coming home to roost. Uh, this shows, uh, 
historic and uh, futures market for wholesale electricity in the ISO New England region. That said, the New York uh, market isn't a whole lot different, so we would expect this to see something like this everywhere. Uh, the red line shows what you'd be paying just for your fuel per megawatt hour if, uh, if you paid $25 a ton. Um, turns out that oftentimes employees like to get paid. There's some debt service. There are other costs associated with, with operating a plant. And those total up to about $70 uh, per megawatt hour. As you'll see from the, that's the, the black, dotted line. Uh, as you'll see from the squiggly lines, there just isn't any time when we think, uh, when the market thinks that uh, on a standalone basis, biomass electricity, given economics like this, are going to be viable, absent some outside public support. Um, so this is yesterday at this time, and today I checked just before the webinar started, doesn't look a whole lot different. You'll see going back, you'll see, uh, you know, here's a wholesale pricing as high as 90 some dollars. Right here, we'd expect it to be somewhere in the, the low $20. It's actually yesterday and today somewhere in the 13 to $14 per megawatt hour. To remind you, fuel alone costs forty dollars. It also costs to um, pay your staff, operate the facility. Obviously, if you're paying forty dollars for fuel and seventy dollars for fuel and operations and getting paid fourteen dollars, that's not a viable business model. Um, there are renewable energy certificates for facilities that can qualify. Those can certainly help um, and for anyone that is operating, it's probably a key piece of their operations. Uh, RECs, renewable energy certificates, right now are you know, plus or minus in the $40 a REC or $40 a megawatt hour range. And that's expected to hold generally, these markets are a little complicated, but hold generally until such time as there's offshore wind in the region, which will probably uh, significantly depress rec market pricing and be the perhaps the final thing that, that happens to the biomass industry. Uh, in addition to being used for electricity, wood can certainly be used for heat. Um, there are a number of uh, existing and proposed biomass heating projects. Uh, traditionally, they've competed very well in in areas reliant on oil for heating, which describes much of uh, the Northeast, particularly the rural Northeast without natural gas infrastructure. Um, that's not true at the moment. We've seen return to low oil prices. So uh, I would expect limited near-term growth. Um, that challenge is offset by some public policy in at least three states, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and soon Maine have thermal renewable energy certificates that can really provide significant funding for ongoing support for, uh, for operation of these facilities. Uh, and pellet markets are operating. Um, most I've spoken to are continuing to produce product. Uh, I wouldn't expect a huge spike in, uh, in new demand, but certainly once someone has a pellet stove, or someone has uh, a pellet heating operation, uh, they, they tend to, to purchase and use the same amount uh, continually. All right, let's talk pulp and paper for a minute. Uh, the, the health of pulp and paper markets is very, very mill specific and importantly, sometimes market specific. So a, a single mill might be in multiple markets. Here's where we are now. Tissue, or really anything used to wipe anything, is in extremely high demand. Orders out uh, that, that folks couldn't have imagined a year ago. Um, the region has uh, switched some production uh, over the last four or five, 10 years. 
uh, to some specialties, moving away from some printing and writing paper. And some of those specialty products are used uh, for PPE, in medical applications. Anything there, again, has very strong demand. Not a huge product in this region, but certainly some of our production goes to packaging. Uh, and uh, anything in packaging is strong. We've seen Amazon, UPS, FedEx all reporting increased business as people aren't going out and, uh, and shopping for themselves. They're having Amazon do it for them. Um, where we're seeing decreases is where this region used to have sort of had placed very, very heavy bets that it has wisely diversified and, and uh, gotten away from uh, sole reliance on the printing and writing paper market over the last 10 years or so. And we've seen about a 50% drop in demand for some grades. That's because if you don't have people at schools and in offices, um, you don't have the demand there. Uh, this is true for uncoated products like office paper. It's actually true for coated products as well. It's actually a machine in Maine that produces the paper used in most brochures. Um, when you think about brochure markets, obviously one of them is uh, highway rest stops and, and everywhere else with tons of things tourists can do. No one's picking those up. No one's reprinting those right now. So we're certainly, um, we're certainly seeing a, a drop there. Um, I think the bigger question, so one is, okay, what's happening right now? The bigger question, the much harder question to answer, and I think the important question is, what's the world look like post-lockdown, which we're starting to emerge from in this region? Um, you know, a number of companies that insisted they couldn't possibly do work from home seem to still be in business. So what does that mean for offices in the future? How will work from home be integrated with, uh, with traditional uh, showing up at an office? And what's that mean for demand? Um, certainly a lot of folks have uh, started using online shopping and grocery delivery more. And a number of people who'd never used it previously have started using it. So what does that mean in terms of uh, uh, printing paper, I'm sorry, uh, packaging materials? And um, some of these market shifts will absolutely be, te be temporary. Um, I suspect some will be structural, uh, permanent, and that might be a huge opportunity or a huge challenge for, for individual mills in this region. Um, I understand that there are markets beyond Maine, but I did this math recently. So just wanted to highlight some, um, I have concerns about low grade market. Uh, uh, New Hampshire has seen a number of biomass plants close or, or plan to close. Uh, in this past year. In Maine alone, we've seen a, a loss of markets for pulp wood and biomass uh, in the last five or six years, equivalent to 4.3 million tons. Um, that's a big deal. That's a lot of pulp wood, a lot of biomass off the market, and we're certainly not alone in seeing that decrease. Uh, because I and almost anyone else can't possibly envision what 4.3 million tons of wood looks like. I did a little math, and if you started my driveway with loaded log trucks or, or chip vans, left no space between them, so went bumper to bumper, you would end up a little south of Orlando, Florida. That's what 4.3 million tons of, of wood looks like. So we've certainly seen, seen those market losses. This isn't everything, this is everything in Maine, but this isn't everything in the region. And I suspect there's some more to come with, with biomass. On the plus side, we're seeing some, um, some emerging, emerging industries. Um, one is we have a new wood-based insulation plant under construction at the, formerly, uh, at the former paper mill in Madison, Maine. And um, that's going to begin commercial construction or commercial production 
this year. This is the first application of this technology in North America, but it's been a uh, technology that's been operating commercially for about a decade in Europe. I suspect this is the first of many plants across the Northeast that uses soft wood chips to produce blown in and, uh, and panel insulation. And I'm very bullish on that, that as, a, as a market opportunity going forward. Um, you know, uh, companies have been looking not only in Maine, but across the region at some new opportunities. Biofuels and biochemicals are certainly things my firm is hearing from, uh, from developers about. We hear about uh, cross-laminated timber. Um, we've got a couple announcements. Again, at this point, we have uh, no production, but I think that's simply a matter of time. And then there's been an effort in Maine, and there's now a beginning effort um, across New Hampshire, Vermont, and New York cooperatively to recruit new wood using facilities. And, uh, and there's an absolute need for new markets for thing for low grade wood, things that aren't, uh, aren't saw logs. So both round wood and, and slash. Uh, what keeps me up at night? What absolutely concerns me? Uh, one is the health and the, the the financial health and the actual age of the logging workforce across the region. Um, I'm 50. I started in the industry at 25. Just sort of casual observations when I started in the industry, the average age of the loggers I was working with, dealing with, were about a decade older than me. That was not a problem when I was 25, and they were about 35. Now that I'm 51, uh, the average age is still about 10 years older than me, which is a big concern and uh, is a huge concern for, uh, I think for anyone that wants to make long-term investments. Will loggers show up? Probably, um, but there, you know, there has to be a way to do this more smoothly than, uh, than it looks like we're heading toward. Um, I've mentioned a few times that I have some concerns about uh, markets for low grade, particularly around residues and biomass, but certainly in some regions, pulpwood. Um, there are technologies that turn wood into fuel and are therefore potentially eligible for the renewable fuel standard, which is uh, a financial support project, uh, financial support system administered by the EPA. Writ large, this is the same system that supports corn ethanol plants in Iowa. Um, EPA's understanding or interpretation of what wood might qualify for, uh, for use in these facilities is extremely limiting for this region. Uh, certainly causes some challenges, not impossibilities, for, but some challenges for anyone uh, wanting to to invest in a in a renewable fuel uh, wood based renewable fuel um, system here, and um, I can tell you there are efforts underway to address that. But if you're imagining that dealing with the EPA bureaucracy in Washington D.C. is easy and smooth, I wish I had uh, your imagination. We certainly have uh, some. Um, some challenges around trucking capacity in the forest products industry. Uh, and, you know, I just always remind industries that uh, having trucks wait in line, particularly long lines, is not helping our uh, trucking capacity challenges. All right, some sort of general thoughts, and that is we're obviously in a recession, and we were due. Uh, we had a 10-year run of a very strong economy, um, some of it propped up on questionable footing, but strong nonetheless. So this was not unanticipated. What was unexpected and is much bigger than anyone anticipated was the trigger, and that was COVID-19, 
uh, the lockdown and uh, economic effects that I think will ripple for uh, certainly for the remainder of this year and probably for some time to come. Um, I wish, I hope I'm wrong on this, but I don't see the economy bouncing back quickly. I'll remind you that in many parts of the country, we went into effective lockdown before there was the government mandate, which tells me that, uh, that it's unlikely we're going to uh, simply return to quote normal uh, just because someone uh, with the first name governor says that that's okay. So the solution or really coming out of this probably relies on millions of individual decisions to go out and lead uh, whatever a new normal life looks like. And that certainly includes getting people back to school, back to offices. Um, I'll remind you because it's probably a heavy to rural audience that uh, the fact that your rural area is fine is incredibly irrelevant. Um, what matters is what's happening in the markets and those tend to be the cities and suburbs and uh and getting those back operating is key to a strong economy and strong markets for forest products um, as i mentioned orders from above just won't get the economy going and there are certainly dangers of ramping up too quickly and going back into something, either a voluntary or mandated uh, lockdown. So coming out of this slow and steady probably provides the greatest long-term benefit. Um, there are gonna be some fundamental changes in how we behave, just as there were post 9-11. Um, I see this as, uh, as an incredible opportunity for the forest products industry, for those folks that can think about where, where the market's going to be and how to seize those opportunities few big things I keep hearing, um, and you've heard these throughout, uh, real concerns about mar uh, markets for low-grade wood. This is nothing new. I've been beating this drum for 25 years. That said, it's now more real than it's ever been. And I'll note that this impacts everyone, but as I mentioned earlier, the, the profits of landowners and really, therefore, the base of the entire forest products economy rests on at some level on sawmills and uh, i have concerns for some mills being able to move their residue and if they can't do that they won't be operating um, near near and midterm there's a lot of inventory both in logs and in finished products this is i'm hearing this across almost all markets in all sectors and what that means practically is that when markets start buying again, they have to work through that inventory, both processed and you know, sitting unprocessed in the yard uh, before they start buying from loggers and landowners and at strong levels again. And that's, that's going to affect us this summer, probably even going into fall. And then um, I have some real concerns about logging infrastructure, uh, people in iron, and uh, what markets are doing doesn't really matter a whole lot if we don't have the professionals able to harvest uh, and transport the, the product. Because I don't want to end on doom and gloom. I'll tell you that I think we're going to be fine. It's going to be rough going, uh, but... Uh, you know, measured over the, the lifetime of a, of a forest, uh, we're gonna be fine coming out of this rotation. Uh, for better or worse, we are accustomed to boom and bust cycles. We're in a bust, um, we've been in a boom, we're gonna return to a boom at some point. And this is an opportunity to position ourselves for that. As much as we have some challenges around markets, we've got markets and compared to some other parts of the country, we have great markets. We have the, uh, the forest resource and we have the supply infrastructure that would make many, many other regions of the country and the world incredibly jealous. I'm gonna touch on this in just a second, but we live 
really in close proximity to and are part of the greatest collection of consumers in the history of the world. And um, I'd say there's probably never been a time to develop a new project or a new technology that uses low grade, uh, particularly softwood. So I'll close with a, a couple maps here. And uh, this I think is our long-term benefit that, that really can't be taken away and positions us well forever. These are the forests of the world. And you see right here, the Amazon basin, Sub-Saharan basin, uh, Pacific Rim. Uh, and then we move up here and this is the Boreal forest starting in Scandinavia, moving across Russia. Remembering this is a globe, it picks up in Alaska, moves across uh, Canada, including uh, some of Northern New England at its southern, well, northern tip of northern New England, southern tip of the Boreal Forest. And then right here, the great Appalachian Forest uh, running down the eastern seaboard. That's where the wood is. These are the markets. Importantly, this is not a population map. This is a wealth map. This is a map of places with the uh, economic uh, ability and might, yeah, we'll go with economic ability, but really the incredible riches to leave the lights on overnight. Which when we think about the history of the world, uh, that is a very, very new phenomenon. So these are the places that can afford to leave the lights on at night. We can assume they can afford to buy some stuff, including our stuff. I'll again remind you where the, where the wood is. This dark patch here that uh, looks like it might be ocean, that's the Amazon forest. Right here, again, might be the ocean, no lights. Uh, that is sub-Saharan Africa. Right here, floating in the ocean, is the forest of the Pacific Rim. Certainly Scandinavia uh, has, uh, is a market, has some wealth. Then we move across uh, Russia, and there just isn't much. Picking up in Alaska again, not much uh, as we move through the Boreal Forest. So we get here, Boreal Forest uh, meets the Appalachian Forest that runs right along the Eastern Seaboard. If you take a look, really the spot that's brightest here is the Eastern Seaboard. And there's one spot and one spot only in the world where significant markets and significant forest resources sit atop one another. And that is our region. And uh, we're very, very fortunate. We have the markets. We are attuned to the consumer and the consumer needs here because we are the consumer. And I think long-term, uh, this is going to uh, provide us you know, enormous opportunities for innovation, uh, new markets, as well as maintaining our, our existing traditional markets. Um, with that, before I close and take questions, I'm happy to, uh, we've, I've got a couple email lists that share information like this. If this is of interest to you, shoot me an email. I'll, uh, I'll make sure you're, you're on those and I'll invite you to dinner an awful lot. Uh, to uh, Forest Resource Association dinners where you can hear material like this. Uh, with that, uh, Chris, I'm ready and happy to, to take some questions and discussion. Okay, we've gotten a few uh, questions in and I invite um, more to be texted in to the questions box on the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, feel free to type in your questions and you can, uh, we will answer them as they come in. Um, one question referred to um, the decline in building permits that you mentioned at the beginning of your presentations, yes. um, you mentioned that some communities were not approving them. Do you think that's like a COVID-19 related shutdown issue or yes. Um, yes. is there another I, I, story there? I should have been clear. It, that was absolutely COVID related. Uh, just people not being in the office, not, 
or planning boards not meeting. Um, a lot of that is now being worked through, but that that delay was a hundred percent because of our our historic systems of people either being in one spot together or needing signatures and our sort of inability to to very quickly transition to new necessary systems. I think most of those transitions are now sort of done and and those those permits should be being worked through. Great. Um, another question relates to cross laminated timber. Um, you mentioned that 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 primarily is a market for softwood. Do you think that hardwoods would uh, would have a role in that as well? Yeah, so there's there is some research being done uh, a little further south in uh, Indiana and Ohio around around use of hardwoods in cross laminated timber and some of it is promising uh, this might be an opportunity for some species cross laminated timber is basically a whole bunch of boards vertically laminated to a layer of a whole bunch of boards horizontally and those the boards vertically provide most of the most of the the up and down strength whereas the horizontal boards are more lateral strength which doesn't need to be as strong so we're certainly hearing about something other than structural lumber being used in those uh, in those lateral layers um, but i i think in the near term when a cross laminated timber manufacturer starts in this region they're going to start with spruce fir which is um, known, understood, easily accessible, and uh, meets all of the all of the building codes, while some others some other species might uh, work their way in over a period of time. Okay. Um, a question came in, and I don't want to get too far off topic here, but um, you mentioned biochemicals. Is that related yeah. to forest products industries? Yes, uh, there are really from a so i'll remind you i'm an economist not a chemist because i'm about to play chemist and one should be cautious here but anything that is made from oil can be made from wood question is can you do it at scale and can you do it economically but so many of our chemicals that are in sort of general use in, in US manufacturing and, and other applications are petroleum derivatives. Most of those have a way to be made from, from wood. Uh, the, the question is, can it be done economically? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of those uh, biochemicals to date have only been someone, you know, been done at the bench scale, at at a university by someone whose first name is doctor. And uh, the real challenge is, is scaling those and making them cost competitive or cost preferential to petroleum products. Great, thanks for that um, information. Um, one question relates to uh, certified wood. And by this, I, I assume that they're talking about like um, uh, forest, uh, Stewardship certifications. Yeah. Um, do you think that that um, allows easier entrance to new markets? And do you think that we have enough certified wood in the region? Uh, so, sort of, there are really two major certifications. There's uh, Forest Stewardship Council, and there is PEFC, which has, which is an internet. They're both international standards, but in the U.S. The American Tree Farm System and the Sustainable Forestry Initiative fall under PEFC. Uh, we certainly have an awful lot of uh, the PEFC certified wood in the region and a good deal of, um, of, of a fair amount of FSC. Varies by state, uh, but we certainly aren't short on it for, uh, for current market demand. I would say that certification has uh, not lived up to 
the hope that existed. It, certification was being rolled out roughly in 1995, plus or minus, when I joined the industry. And there were very high hopes that consumers would use their pocketbooks, demand certified wood products, and the landowners and forestry professionals would be rewarded for doing a good job. Consumers haven't uh, regularly shown that to be the case, um, particularly not for uh, bulk products that are commodity products that aren't seen. Um, probably the spots where it's had the greatest uh, consumer base side is in something like furniture or flooring where, uh, where folks see it every day and, and can think that through. Um, that said, some of the very large buyers, so think uh, folks that buy paper for magazines, for example, are do demand and, and are requiring certification. It's probably going to be important for, um, for some new products, but I would say certification writ large isn't what we hoped it would be. And in many ways it's become a, um, almost a, a, a necessary uh, a necessary bureaucratic uh, documentation for large scale market access, but no premium associated with it. Okay, uh, a couple of questions have come up relating to the forest workforce. Um, yeah. What do you think could be done to make, um, to perhaps attract more people, uh, particularly more young people into the workforce? Um, th that is a huge question. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about it and can tell you, I do not have the simple solution. I, I wish it existed. I hope it exists and that folks smarter than me come up with it. That said, um, early, uh, Early awareness of the opportunities for careers in the forest products industry is very highly correlated with uh, people being interested in, in actually uh, doing something. In fact, um, saw recently that something like 25% of people working at a particular sawmill in Georgia had gotten the Boy Scout Forestry Merit Badge and that that is how they sort of became um, became aware of that. So certainly early opportunities to learn about career opportunities is important and there are a lot of ways that that can be done. Uh, there are programs in uh, New York and Maine and you know sprouting up in other places that really serve as short-term schools, uh, you know six, eight week uh, on the ground, very practical training to get people. Uh, into logging equipment, operating it, and uh, joining the logging workforce. Um, uh, for logging in particular, I think we need to, to rethink um, how logging is financed. Certainly when it costs $2 million to start up a crew, that's a big deal. And, uh, and that very much limits who can start a crew and who can grow a crew. So thinking about how um, who participates in that and how is probably uh, something that the industry needs to face going forward. There are already some sawmills that have their own logging crews. I suspect we're gonna see more of that. Um, so there are a lot of little things that can be done, but I, I unfortunately don't have, uh, and I'm not sure that the silver bullet exists. Okay, so building on that, um, the, the industry, at least the logging part of it, has changed significantly in recent years. Um, you know, before the, you might have had a logger outside with a chainsaw, now they're more likely to be in a, mach in a machine. Yes. Um, has that affected the, uh, the, the workforce and entry into it, do you think? Oh, it absolutely has. I mean, right now, the, you know, it used to be um, a cable skitter and uh, a chainsaw and you had yourself um, a logging crew. A couple brothers go off and start that. Right now, for you know, grapple skitter, um, fella buncher, uh, some some equipment to operate the yard. You're talking a couple million dollars to get in, and that obviously uh, creates a barrier to entry. Um, that's 
you know, that that's an issue. And uh, that said, the, those machines are much more efficient. They're uh, better user experience and incredibly uh, safe compared to, uh, to being out uh, out with a chainsaw. So there are enormous benefit, but how, uh, how we make sure that there are logging crews going forward probably needs to be thoroughly thought through. And I'm not sure that all independent contractors, which is basically what we've had for the last 20 years, I'm not entirely sure that's a sustainable model. Great, thanks. Uh, a question came in. Uh, thoughts on on dead oak from a from gypsy moth mortality, and I'm going to expand that to perhaps uh, thoughts on invasive invasives more broadly. Um, we have a number of of issues or threats uh, from invasives, including the emerald ash borer. Um, it's not really a forest problem, but there's there's perhaps risk from Asian longhorn beetle. There's um, uh, there's the hemlock woolly adelgid. There's a number of um, of invasives that are yeah, affecting forest health. Yeah. And there's uh, this, you know Maine sitting around wait Maine and in, in northern New Hampshire, northern Vermont are sort of waiting for the the spruce budworm. We're we're at about the point in the cycle where we'd expect a, a minor infestation um, of that, and we're already seeing that in parts of New Brunswick and Quebec. So um, unfortunately, there, you know, we are in a time where forest health is going to be a growing concern. As we have warmer winters, it's going to be a continually growing concern. And what to do with uh, particular species is going to be incredibly uh, localized in terms of what markets exist and what you can do. Um, I think, unfortunately, for some of this, when we look at salvage opportunities, if it's not harvested very quickly, it's going to be borderline, uh, borderline worthless economically to, to the landowner. Uh, there certainly may be some ecological and other values by dropping some trees and leaving them there. But uh, in terms of return to the landowner, forest health is, uh, has been, and I think will be a, a growing challenge. Great. Um, well, not shifting great. gears here a little bit. Um, the forest, uh, the working nation of the, excuse me, the notion of working forests has sometimes been controversial for environmental reasons or others. Um, how, how much of an issue do you think that uh, sort of opposition to uh, forest harvesting um, and that sort of thing, uh, how much of an issue do you think that is? And do you think that there's um, perhaps opportunities there to get past that? So I'd say in many regions where we've we've progressed on that, uh, in many parts of the region we've progressed on that. Um, that said, this past year saw sort of some high profile, very vocal opposition to harvesting on public land in Western Massachusetts. Um, obviously that, um, you know, that's localized, but it, it gets coverage. It, it spreads and it encourages other folks. I would say the, the spot where we're gonna have the biggest challenge in terms of working forests is on public land, be it state owned or you know, for a long time, well, the, uh, the timber programs on the White Mountain and Green Ma Mountain National Forest aren't near their historic levels. Um, so working forest on private lands is generally less controversial not without controversy, but uh, I think it's gonna be an absolute challenge and something we need to keep, we as, a, as an industry and as a community need to keep fighting for, which is some level of uh, forest management, working forests on public lands, because those public lands in many ways can, can showcase to, um, the, to the broader public, particularly to a suburban and urban public, that uh, forest management and other uses of the forests are highly compatible. Great. Um, as you know, I'm sure a big market for hardwoods is Asia, China specifically, but other Asian countries as well. Um, and that took a big hit due to the uh, trade wars as well as uh, the coronavirus. 
do you see that uh, market returning um, or do you, you know, what's your outlook for that? Yeah, so that market is returning. My concern is I'm, you know, a lot of, well, when we ship either logs or lumber to Asia, one of two things happens to it. It becomes a product that gets sold for them domestically. So gets sold, for example, in China, uh, or it's manufactured and sent back to us and um, we buy it. We're at the beginning of a global recession. Uh, that means less money floating around in the economy, less discretionary spending. And that's probably true here as well as in Asia. So I think we're gonna have those Asian markets return, but they're not gonna be what they were, uh, let's say a year and a half ago, right before the tariffs got, uh, got imposed. We're not gonna go back to that because the market demand isn't there. And it's going to be a multi-year climb to get back to that level of economic activity. Okay, uh, question about carbon markets, carbon sequestration. Um, what, what, if any, role do you see in those for forest management, particularly in compliance? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just note that my firm um, is very involved in uh, carbon markets. And really in carbon, there's, there's sort of two large pools of markets. One is compliance that tends to be run through the California Air Resources, Air Resources Board market. And the other is the voluntary market. And that's where, you know, if you hear Amazon say they're carbon neutral or, or Microsoft or someone like that, they went out and bought carbon credits. Forests are eligible and really the bulk of carbon credits available in both the compliance and the voluntary system. Um, the compliance system uh, is a hundred year. Uh, you sell uh, carbon credits for a hundred years, which a lot of folks view as a very long time to, to contract for. Um, there are certainly some very successful projects that we've seen in the region in the compliance market. Um, but uh, where we're really seeing interest going forward is, is much more on the voluntary side. Uh, voluntary market provides, um, provides more flexibility, shorter timeline, and uh, tends to, and this is very, site and forest and management plan specific. But for, for folks that own a lot of land that have a forest management plan that cuts less than growth over a sustained period of time, that's uh, the, the voluntary market has provided some enormous opportunities. We're about to see some of those deals close in this region for you know, landowners to get paid uh, multi-millions of dollars and uh, probably won't negatively impact wood flows at all. So I think going forward, that's gonna be a, a growing market, a growing opportunity. Okay, uh, we're at the top of the hour and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So I'm gonna um, just kind of ask you one last question and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, you, you expressed a lot of concern in your in, in this presentation about low-grade markets. Um, what do you think needs to happen um, in the Northeast region to sort of remedy that? And, and what's the likelihood of that happening, do you think? Yeah, so the near-term solution is to make sure our existing assets can operate for a little while. So that would be uh, biomass plants probably need subsidies if if we want to have them. And obviously that's a state by state and can be very controversial, uh, but um, that's absolutely needed uh, near term as well as making sure our existing pulp and paper mills have what they need um, to survive and, and potentially reinvest as many of them have throughout the region. Uh, long term, I think we're we really need to look to uh, what are the market opportunities going forward and how do we attract those to this region. So that includes biofuels and biochemicals. And again, uh, EPA interpretations of the renewable fuel standard is something that needs to be addressed there. 
Um, I mentioned the insulation plant going in at the former pulp and paper mill in, uh, in Madison, Maine. Um, opportunities like that need to be found, uh, seized and brought here. And there's absolutely a role for the economic development agencies in really all the states in the region to become uh, more acquainted with and better advocates for our forest products industry. All too often, we as an industry have, um, have sort of dealt with our state forest service and not as much with the economic development agencies. Um, I'd say that's at least half our fault. And uh, we need to really incorporate what we need into, uh, into state activities meant to support existing and recruit new users of wood to the region. Great. So we, we got to many of the questions. I apologize that we weren't able to get to all of them. Um, certainly a, a very interesting topic and a lot of great information here. Um, before we sign off, I'd like to just um, mention a couple of things. We had several questions about the webinar recording and or the slides. Um, both of those will be available at farmcredities.com slash webinars. Or if you go to farmcredities.com under the Knowledge Exchange tab, you can see our webinars uh, page. All of our webinars, past, present, and future, including this one, uh, reside there. So you will be able to access the recording and the slides of today's presentation. Uh, they should be posted by, uh, by this time tomorrow. It takes a little bit of time to get it up there. Um, I would also like to mention our resource hub for COVID-19 resources. Um, COVID-19 has certainly affected um, every industry throughout the region. Um, our resource hub is updated usually almost every day uh, with current information on loan programs, relief programs, that sort of thing. Uh, farmcredities.com slash resource hub or it's accessible on our home page. Um, Farm Credities, if, for those of you that are not familiar with us, we are a um, uh, member-owned cooperative. We service the natural resource-based businesses, which is uh, agriculture, forest products, and fishing in the Northeast U.S. Um, and uh, we would be happy to talk to any of you about opportunities for us to serve you. Um, with that, I will um, give it back to Eric for any final thoughts, and um, we'll wrap up. Eric? Uh, thank you, Chris. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and, and uh participate in your knowledge exchange series. If folks have particular questions, I shared my email earlier. It's kingsley at inrsllc.com. To the extent I can, can help you out or point you to a resource, I'm, I'm very willing to do so. And I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, to have this discussion with, with your folks. So thank you.